Hello everyone, we are back reading Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. We're about to start off with Chapter 10, Halloween. And look at that monster there. How could that be related? I am super excited to see that monster. We just found out that the item stolen from Gringotts, or that was attempted to be stolen from Gringotts, was almost certainly the small package that Hagrid took. And that it's probably what's being held in the third floor corridor that's forbidden. Let's find out what happens next. Malfoy couldn't believe his eyes when he saw that Harry and Ron were still at Hogwarts the next day, looking tired but perfectly cheerful. Indeed, by the next morning, Harry and Ron thought that meeting the three-headed dog had been an excellent adventure, and they were quite keen to have another one. In the meantime, Harry filled Ron in about the package that seemed to have moved from Gringotts to Hogwarts, and they spent a lot of time wondering what could possibly need such heavy protection. It's either really valuable or really dangerous, said Ron. Or both, said Harry. But as they, all they knew for sure about the mysterious object was that it was about two inches long, they didn't have much chance of guessing what it was without further clues. Neither Neville nor Hermione showed the slightest interest in what lay underneath the dog and the trapdoor. All Neville cared about was never going near the dog again. That's understandable. Hermione was now refusing to speak to Harry and Ron, but she was such a bossy know-it-all that they saw this as a bonus. All they really wanted now was a way of getting back at Malfoy, and to their great delight, just such a thing arrived in the mail about a week later. As the owls flooded into the Great Hall as usual, everyone's attention was caught at once by a long, thin package carried by six large screech owls. Six! Harry was just as interested as everyone else to see what was in this large parcel, and was amazed when the owls soared down and dropped it right in front of him, knocking his bacon to the floor. They had hardly fluttered out of the way when another owl dropped a letter on top of the parcel. Harry ripped open the letter first, which was lucky because it read, Do not open the parcel at the table. It contains your new Nimbus 2000. But I don't... Oh, sorry. It contains your Nimbus 2000, but I don't want everybody knowing that you'll get a broomstick or they'll all want one. Oliver Wood will meet you tonight on the Quidditch field at 7 o'clock for your first training session. Signed, Professor McGonagall. Look at that. Professor M. McGonagall. I wonder what her first name is. Harry had difficulty hiding his glee as he handed the note to Ron to read. A Nimbus 2000? Ron moaned enviously. I've never even touched one. They left the halt quickly, wanting to unwrap the broomstick in private before their first class, but halfway across the entrance hall, they found the way upstairs barred by Crab and Goyle. Malfoy seized the package from Harry and felt it. That's a broomstick, he said, throwing it back to Harry with a mixture of jealousy and spite on his face. You'll be in for it this time, Potter. First years aren't allowed them. Ron couldn't resist it. It's not any old broomstick, he said. It's a Nimbus 2000. What did you say you got at home, Malfoy? A uh, Comet 260? Ron grinned at Harry. Comets look flashy, but they're not in the same league as the Nimbus. What would you know about it, Weasley? You couldn't afford half the handle, Malfoy snapped back. I suppose you and your brothers have to save up twig by twig. Before Ron could answer, Professor Flitwick appeared at Malfoy's elbow. Not arguing, I hope, boys, he squeaked. Potter's got a broomstick, Professor, said Malfoy quickly. Yes, yes, that's right, said Professor Flitwick, beaming at Harry. Professor McGonagall told me all about the special circumstances, Potter. And what model is it? A uh, Nimbus 2000, sir, said Harry, fighting not to laugh at the look of horror on Malfoy's face. And it's really thanks to Malfoy, yes, I've got it. Harry and Ron headed upstairs, smothering their laughter at Malfoy's obvious rage and confusion. Well, it's true, Harry chortled as they reached the top of the marble staircase. If he hadn't stolen Neville's remember all, I wouldn't be on the team. So I suppose you think that's a, rule, a reward for breaking rules, came an angry voice from just behind them. Hermione was stomping up the stairs, looking disapprovingly at the package in Harry's hand. I thought you weren't speaking to us, said Harry. Yes, don't stop now, said Ron. It's doing us so much good. <laughs> Hermione marched away with her nose in the air. <laughs> Harry had a lot of trouble keeping his mind on his lessons that day. It kept wandering up to the dormitory where his new broomstick was lying on his bed, or straying off to the Quidditch field where he'd be learning to play that night. 
He bolted his dinner that evening without noticing what he was eating, and then rushed upstairs with Ron to unwrap the Nimbus 2000 at last. Wow, Ron sighed as the broomstick rolled onto Harry's bedspread. Even Harry, who knew nothing about the different brooms, thought it looked wonderful. Sleek and shiny, with a mahogany handle, it had a long tail of neat, straight twigs and Nimbus 2000 written in gold near the top. As seven o'clock drew nearer, Harry left the castle and set off in dusk toward the Quidditch field. He'd never been inside the stadium before. Hundreds of seats were raised in stands around the field so that the spectators were high enough to see what's going on. At either end of the field were three little golden poles with hoops on the end. They reminded Harry of the little plastic sticks muggle children blew bubbles through, except that they were fifty feet high. Too eager to fly again to wait for wood, Harry mounted his broomstick and kicked off from the ground. What a feeling! He swooped in and out of the goalposts and then sped up and down the field. The Nimbus 2000 turned wherever he wanted at its lightest touch. Hey, Potter, come down! Oliver Wood had arrived. He was carrying a large wooden crate under his arm. Harry landed next to him. Very nice, said Wood, his eyes glinting. I see what McGonagall meant. You really are a natural. I'm just going to teach you the rules this evening, then you'll be joining team practice three times a week. He opened the crate. Inside were four different sized balls. Right, said Wood. Now, Quidditch is easy enough to understand, even if it's not too easy to play. There are seven players on each side. Three of them are called chasers. Three chasers, Harry repeated, as Wood took out a bright red ball about the size of a soccer ball. This ball's called the quaffle, said Wood. The chasers throw the quaffle to each other and try to get it through one of the hoops to score a goal. Ten points every time the quaffle goes through one of the hoops. Follow me? The chasers, oh, sorry, the chasers throw the quaffle and put it through the hoops to score, Harry recited. So that's sort of like basketball on broomsticks with six hoops, right? What's basketball? said Wood curiously. <laughs> Never mind, said Harry quickly. Now, there's another player on each side who's called the keeper. I'm keeper for Gryffindor. I have to fly around our hoops and stop the other three from the other team from scoring. Three chasers, one keeper, said Harry, who was determined to remember it all. And they play with the quaffle. All right, got that. So what are they for? He pointed at the three balls left inside the box. I'll show you now, said Wood. Take this. He handed Harry a small club, a bit like a short baseball bat. I'm going to show you what the bludgers do, Wood said. These two are the bludgers. He showed Harry two identical balls, jet black and slightly smaller than the red quaffle. Harry noticed that they seemed to be straining to escape the straps holding them inside the box. Stand back, Wood warned Harry. He bent down and freed one of the bludgers. At once, the black ball rose high in the air and then pelted straight at Harry's face. Harry swung at it the way with the bat to stop it from breaking his nose and sent it zigzagging away into the air. It zoomed over their heads and then shot at Wood, who dived on top of it and managed to pin it to the ground. <sighs> See? Wood panted, forcing the struggling bludger back into the crate and strapping it down safely. The bludgers rock it about, trying to knock players off their brooms. That's why you have two beaters on your team. The Weasley twins are ours. It's their job to protect their side from the bludgers and try to knock them toward the other team. So, think you got all that? Three chasers try and score with the quaffle, the keeper guards the goalpost, the beaters keep the bludgers away from the team, Harry reeled off. Very good, said Wood. Uh, have the bludgers, have the bludgers ever killed anyone? Harry asked, hoping he sounded offhand. Never at Hogwarts, we've had a couple of broken jaws, but nothing worse than that. Now, the last member of the team is the seeker. That's you, and you don't have to worry about the quaffle or the bludgers. Unless they crack my head open. Don't worry, the Weasleys are more than a match for the bludgers. I mean, they're like a pair of human bludgers themselves. Wood reached into the crate and took out the fourth and last ball. Compared with the quaffle and the bludgers, it was tiny, about the size of a large walnut. It was bright gold and had little fluttering silver wings. This, said Wood, is the golden snitch. And it's the most important ball of the lot. It's very hard to catch because it's so fast and difficult to see. It's the seeker's job to catch it. You've got to weave in and out of the chasers, beaters, bludgers, and quaffle to get it before the other team's seeker. Because whichever seeker catches the snitch wins his team an extra 150 points. So they nearly always win. 
That's why Seekers get fouled so much. A game of Quidditch only ends when the snitch is caught, so it can go on for ages. I think the record is three months. They had to keep bringing on substitutes so the players could get some sleep. <laughs> it's no wonder no one... Oh. Well, that's it. Any questions? Harry shook his head. He understood what he had to do all right. It was doing it that was going to be the problem. We won't practice with the snitch yet, said Wood, carefully shutting it back inside the crate. It's too dark. We might lose it. Let's try you out with a few of these. He pulled a bag of ordinary golf balls out of his pocket, and a few minutes later, he and Harry were up in the air, Wood throwing the golf balls as hard as he could in each direction for Harry to catch. Harry didn't miss a single one, and Wood was delighted. After half an hour, night had really fallen, and they couldn't carry on. That Quidditch couple have our name on it this year, said Wood happily as they trudged back up to the castle. I wouldn't be surprised if he turned out better than Charlie Weasley. And he could have played for England if he hadn't gone off chasing dragons. But the rest will have to wait until next time.